this is really a pleasure to be here. I looked forward to it ever since I left. And of course I went to Washington and to Virginia to the doctors because I need a whole lot of propping up when you get to be my age. You can't just throw things off. So I had some of the best doctors in the country and I'm so much better. But all of the way they were saying, well, just stay a little longer. I said, no, I can't stay any longer because I promised Judy Cumbie I would be back. And I'm not here just for today. I'm here to the end. And whatever I can do or say, naturally, I will hope that it would be of some substance that they can use. And we're just talking about uh, getting all enthusiastic about something and then getting home and forgetting it. <laughs> or not telling it to our friends or to those whom we have met. And I don't think we do very much good as a, a person who would carry the message unless we are going to give it to others. And I'm hoping, we don't ask everybody to take everything we say, but we say the thing to do is to investigate. And I say that because of the fact that that's what I did. I did investigating, and uh, it started back there when we fought so hard to get people to register and vote. <coughs> and I don't know, uh, it's nobody who has worked as hard or as far back as I did, and that is living now because so many of them are dead. But uh, I had never been involved in the people being beaten down as they were on plantations. If you don't know anything about it, I'm quite sure you have heard about the plantation system. Well, I was born in Savannah, Georgia, and when I was asked to come to Selma and Dallas County to work for the United States Department of Agriculture, I was appalled, I was surprised to find out that people were still slaves. And they were not only slaves physically, mentally, they were slaves. They would tell you real quickly, well, I, I can't do that because Mr. Charlie wouldn't like it. But they were mentally enslaved. And we started teaching them how to free themselves like they were when they became converted. We want you to become converted. And you can't be converted by just accepting. You've got to find out within yourself, take away all of the things that are keeping you down, and think for yourself. And we went through a whole lot. But it was worth it. <clears throat> the going to jail, the being beaten and left for dead, to having our house shot in, to lose my husband, all of that was worth it. And I'm, I'm not going to take too long, but I do want to tell you how we have to wake people up. And sometimes, to me, it's like the problem of a clock, where you can hit, 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 but until you hit that pendulum, you don't stop that clock. And the fight that we had to get people to vote. It just happened, the, the, the light that we had that kept us going is the people in the rural district with whom we were working. They believed in us, and they knew that we were working for them. And we would tell them that you are not going to get any farther than this plantation unless you become a registered voter. That was the main thing for people everywhere and for those in the rural district to become a registered voter and to get a piece of property of your own. Think for yourself and your children. <coughs> because during that time, 
The schools were one room school, three months long, only three months. One teacher in this one room school. And I have been into the schools because I was working with both the young people and the adults too, the 4 H Club. Some of you know about the 4 H Club and the women's organization. And we would go to the schools and there were schools, particularly two of them. One had 105 students, the other had 101. And a one room school with shuttered windows and a pot bellied stove, which meant the kids had to bring wood. And when they put the wood in the stove, if it smoked <coughs> and it was cold, then they would be there stifling, trying their best to read, and couldn't read because of the fact that there was no light worth anything. But yet, some of those people came out great. Because after all of those years, 30 years, a generation decided we were going to be somebody. And the parents pushed them, saying, I want you to do better than I'm doing. <coughs> so there wasn't too much they could do on the plantation because they had only on Saturdays off. And Saturdays they would go to town. They had no money hardly. But when they would go to town, they would have to be just in two streets in Selma, and that's Franklin Street and Alabama Avenue. And they would come from different counties to see their friends, see the people, buy anything that they've got. And it, it, it was just a pleasure, and that was all. And they figured it was fine, because I got a day off until they began to wake up. They thought it was fine to have to work from morning to night, especially when, when there was something to be done on the farm, until they began to wake up and say, as my husband told them, if you can, if you can raise 10 bales or 15 bales for the plantation, you can get five bales or two bales and it'll be yours. Because this is the way the system went. On just before Christmas, the head of the family was told, come to the big house or come to the store if they had it. We're going to have a settlement. Okay, the head of the family will go. And the, fam the, the, the way that the, fa the uh, way they closed the year's work was like this. The plantation owner would say, well, John, <coughs> you did pretty good. Now, you made seven bales of cotton. And you know you can't half a bale. So you take three, and I'll take three. I'll take the other one because you can't half it. And they would listen. Many of them knew better. Now, John, you know the old mule died. You had to have another mule. Okay. And we had to buy seeds. You got to take that out. And you had to have fertilizer. And then the boll weevils. You know, we had to have something to, to keep the boll weevils from destroying the crop. And he figures. And he said, well, John, you know, your daughter took sick. And you called and told me that you had, your daughter needed a doctor. And I had to see about that. I had to take that out. And then last year, before Christmas, you came to me and said, you wanted some money to give your children Christmas. And I had to let you have money. And now, John, you're almost out of debt. You just owe me $250. John had his feet in the soil and couldn't get it out of that plantation. And my husband, who 
also came from a farm, but his people owned 200 acres in Georgia. And my not having known about this life, we began to fight those people. And we became naturally uh, outcasts. <coughs> then our own friends decided that I, not, I'm not going to have anything to do with you all because of the fact that you're disturbing the way of life and you're going to cause trouble. And that's the way they felt about it. We are going to cause trouble. And the trouble was what we, were, we got into. My husband was run off of the road. They shot into the house. For six years, they didn't give my, my son license to practice law. Because, and when he made an attempt to go to, to uh, Tennessee, the sheriff, Sheriff Clark, said he was not going to send the application that he had to uh, endorse because uh, these, they disturb our way of life. And everything being arrested, everything they did, they made it hard for us. So it was, we weren't tired, but they always had somebody, they were afraid to go as far as, as they wanted to with us because of the fact uh, we were working for the government. But there was a guy who was working before us, C.J. Adams, who had seen three wars. And Adams was helping those people who were in the service to get pensions. And they didn't like it. Seeing these people getting money? Oh no, you got to stop that. And he wouldn't stop it because the people had no income worth anything. No, nobody had any, any income worth anything. No people of color, even the teachers when I came, they were getting $20 a month. And in the event that they were working on their masters, they would give them $25 a month. That was the salary that they were getting. And this is what they, they didn't like, our disturbing the folk. So then, when Rosa Parks sat on the bus, and I might say, when Rosa sat on that bus, she did what uh, I might say a symbol was. If you're standing in a body of water, let's say the Gulf, and you take a brick, and throw it in the gulf, or take a rock, then you have a wave. And then that wave goes on farther and farther and farther. And you don't know where that wave ended. That was the way the movement started. When they began to crucify us, and we looked around, there was C.J. Adams, we had him to work with us, and a few other people who were registered voters. I became a registered voter at 21. At that time, you had to be 21. And when I was 21 in 1933, I became a registered voter. And when C.J. Adams continued to help these people to get an income to be spent in Selma, Alabama, they put him in jail. And as soon as he came out of jail, he continued to do the same thing. He didn't fear because he was doing right. And ladies and gentlemen, fear is a terrible thing. Fear is something that will keep us, any individual, from growing mentally. So at last, they found out they could not stop him from giving and getting the pensions that these people were actually due, they ran him out of town. <coughs> and J.L. Chestnut was the one who had to take him out of town at night. <coughs> but now, they tried to run us out of town, and my husband said this, that's my house, and I don't let anybody come and run me out of my house. Well, they tried every kind of way. They, oh, I, it'll take years to tell you what they did to him. Anyway, when, 
When Rosa Parks sat on the bus, and that wave, that rock that she threw into the mental river, and that ripple brought forth Dr. King. And when we went to the first meeting Dr. King had in Montgomery, we went to him and asked him to please come to Selma. We are having trouble in Selma. And he said, well, I can't come, but I'll send somebody. And he sent a young man from Fisk University, Bernard Lafayette. Bernard Lafayette got the young people. He first went to the high school, segregated high school, uh, which at that time was, uh, what was it, R.B. Hudson School. And he saw some of the young youth on the, foot, on the uh, outside. And he said, come here. Uh, would you like to learn some freedom songs? And they said, yes. He said, okay, I'll teach you some freedom songs. And now, when I think of that, I think of these young people, and that's the way they got us to have what we have in this last election, by singing, by getting to their minds and their hearts, and letting them know there was something else that they could do other than just run for an office. <coughs> so they, when, this, the, when the principal of the school, which was one of my husband's 4 H club boy, whom he had insisted and helped to go to college, and he was not a registered voter. Nobody was a registered voter but a few people who were leftovers from 1910 and 12. And when he saw what this guy was doing, he ran him off of the, the uh, ground. And these young people followed him. Then he went to Salem University. And the principal there, whose salary was paid by black churches, the school was made by blacks, the students were black. And then he said, and I'm telling you this because I want you to know how people's brains work, how fear can destroy <coughs> their minds so that they don't think at all. They let other people think for them. And when he ran Bernard off of the ground, then the students left. And that was the beginning of mush the mushroom of Bloody Sunday. I'm going to tell you one thing that happened that woke up also these, the adults. My husband, after they had pressured him so much, he retired and opened a real estate and insurance business down on Franklin Street. A man came in there to beat him up. Now he had had little strokes every time seemingly that uh, things would happen, he would have a stroke. He had about four of them. And this guy came into his office with a stick to beat him. And when that happened, I happened to be there, but when he raised the stick, I caught it. And that was the only thing that kept that stick that was loaded, the head of it was loaded with metal. It would have killed him right there. But a day or two afterwards, he went to the hospital, and he never came out alive. He gave his life. Now, Bernard said to the, to the youth, I want you to tell everybody, to tell everybody that Mr. Boynton has passed and we are going to have a memorial. He went to the Tabernacle Baptist Church, one of the bigger churches in Selma. He asked the minister, Reverend L. L. Amos, to let him have the memorial at his church. Reverend Anderson, who had worked with us underground because he feared his parishioners, he said, yes, I'd be glad to do it. Then he went to 
the, uh, the people who control the church, the deacons. They said, oh, no, you don't. You don't have any memorial here for that man. You know white people don't like him, and we don't like him either. So Reverend Anderson said, okay, if I can't have it in the church, I'll have it in the street. And it, I think it shook them. He said, all right, have it in the church. Jim Clark, who was the sheriff at that time, called all full-blooded white men to come to my office, be sworn in, and be given ammunition. The ammunition was a club. When these people, on Friday night, when these people came to church, some 400 of them, they had to come through a line of deputized sheriffs. Many of them, Selma Small, many of them knew the people who were going to church. Many of them stayed outside. Some went in the church. They took the tag <coughs> number of every vehicle that was parked on the outside. And this was Friday night. On Monday morning, when they went to their places where they worked, lumberyard, the factories, and all of the places they worked, they were told, you don't have any job. You're fired. And they said, fired? Fired for what? You're fired because you attend that memorial for that S.W. point. And the adults, for the first time, used their minds and said, well, I didn't know I was a slave. Here are my children out there going to jail. And they put them in jail until they didn't have any place for them. They are being beaten. And I'm sitting up here saying, well, they're doing it for me. Now, I'm going to get in those lines. I'm going to march and I'm going to demonstrate until I become a registered voter. So I said to myself, even death, something good can come out of it. My husband's death brought to those people the realization that they were not slaves and they were human beings. And I say that to say that fear is one of the worst things a person can do, be afraid. Those people were afraid to talk. They were afraid to say that I want to be registered. They were afraid to get off of the farm until we let them know that will help you. So I think that if you know anything about people who are afraid, just let them know that's a handicap. You're handicapped when you're afraid because you can let so much of the good things pass by. But I say to even the children, don't be afraid. Be sure you're doing right. And if we didn't get the majority of the people in the, in the uh, Senate and in Congress, if we didn't do it, then of course it would not have been done. But it was the young people who were not afraid. And we've got a representation here of young people who went into, into uh, New York, they went into Boston, they went into California, uh, St. Louis, and places where it looks like they, everything was hanging on the balance. And they were not afraid. They were not afraid to sing, to make songs up about what fear will do. What will do if you don't get people to represent you and not just go up there and sit down in Congress and in the Senate. So I say to each and every one of you, let us not be afraid. When we know we are right, then go ahead.